on 6th February 2023, a pair of powerful earthquakes of magnitude 7.8 and 7.6 struck Turkey and Syria. A series of aftershocks followed. What ensued was one of the biggest catastrophes the world has ever seen. Official figures indicate that the quakes have left more than 50,000 dead till date. Lakhs are injured and millions are homeless. Why were these quakes so devastating? How did they become so deadly? Can the human body endure and survive such disasters? What can we do to improve our odds of survival? Let us find out in this video. My name is Dr. Gokulasar. I'm the bloody physiologist. Welcome to my channel. Earthquakes happen when tectonic plates, which are gigantic pieces of Earth's crust and mantle, collide against each other. This releases tremendous amount of energy onto the surface, causing catastrophic damage. Turkey and Syria both lie on a seismic hotspot where there is convergence of multiple tectonic plates. Throughout history, both these countries have been subject to multiple ground-shaking earthquakes for the same reason. But why was the latest quake so deadly? Geologists estimate that the latest quake was a result of seismic events that occurred just 18 kilometers below the Earth's surface. This is relatively shallow and a large amount of energy found its way to the surface unhindered. The quakes occurred in densely populated areas in the early morning hours, both of which contributed to the higher number of deaths and injuries. Reports also suggest that the population in the quake-affected area live in unreinforced structures with mediocre construction that are extremely vulnerable to tremors. All these factors significantly increase the extent of damage to life and property. How does an earthquake affect the human body? It is well known that the main reason for injury and death in earthquakes is getting hit by falling objects like bricks, masonry and furniture. As this is a scenario that is most likely to involve damage to the human body, this is where our main focus is going to be. Remember, in case of a building collapse, how soon you die depends on the supply of air and how long you survive depends on the supply of water. Does it make sense? Let us find out. First, we'll get some grim facts out of the way. The most common direct cause of death in case of a collapsed building is suffocation. It can occur due to compression of the chest or obstruction of the airways. How does this happen? Normal respiration, the process of breathing in and out, is attributable to the volume changes that occur inside the thorax. During inspiration, the diaphragm, which is the main respiratory muscle in our body, moves longitudinally down and the ribs elevate, increasing the vertical and anteroposterior diameters thus liberating more space inside the thorax. The lungs, which are adhered to the thorax via pleura, get pulled apart and expands. This expansion causes an increase in volume and decrease in pressure inside the lungs. Air from outside, which is at a higher atmospheric pressure, rushes into the lungs. These changes reverse during expiration. When building materials weighing several hundred kilos are pressing down on the thorax, the movement of the diaphragm and ribs are compromised. This limits the ability to breathe. Higher the compression, lower is the lung volume, lower is the amount of oxygen that is available to the tissues, which ultimately leads to death. Even if a trapped person is able to avoid being compressed, he or she is not safe from being suffocated. The debris lying around can cause airway obstruction which can lead to suffocation. Also, being trapped in a confined space for extended periods can cause accumulation of carbon dioxide, which again causes suffocation. However, a victim trapped inside a collapsed building, lucky enough to have uninterrupted air supply, cannot rejoice yet, as there are still other fatal injuries which await their turn. From bruises and fractures to burns and contusions, any form of injury can occur to the head, chest, abdomen or limbs. Fractured bones can tear away blood vessels, leading to profuse bleeding. Fractured ribs can cause pneumothorax that can again cause suffocation. 
impalement by construction materials such as steel rods can damage internal organs. Short circuits within the collapse structure can cause electrocution or burns. It seems as if the odds are stacked heavily against those who are trapped. But then, you start seeing news like this. How can anyone still be alive under there? This is a very important question asked by rescuers themselves but one that often goes unanswered. Knowing the maximum survival time lets rescuers gauge risk-benefit ratio and decide on resource allocation. The UN usually calls off search and rescue 5 to 7 days after a disaster, once no one is found alive for a day or two. But there have been many instances where people have been found alive much beyond this time frame. The Haiti earthquake in 2010 left almost 150,000 dead and 1.5 million homeless. Out of the 140 odd people who were pulled alive from the rubble, some were rescued after 10 to 12 days, albeit injured and dehydrated. What made their survival possible? Survival depends heavily on the immediate moments after a quake where the victim is trapped and whether there is adequate air supply. Like I said earlier, air supply decides how soon one dies. If the victims are uninjured, have air supply and adequate space, the next key thing that decides their survival is access to water. Our bodies can survive more than a month without food, but without water, we can hardly survive a couple of days. Almost 60% of our body is made up of water. From regulating body temperature to flushing out waste products, dissolving nutrients and lubricating joints, water plays a vital role in ensuring survival. Thus, adequate supply of water is very important. But what is equally important is limiting the loss of water from the body. When your body loses more water than what you can supply, dehydration occurs. Being trapped in a confined space can lead to loss of water through sweat and breath. The extent of dehydration depends on the individual, namely the person's age, sex, weight, activity level, and the environmental factors like ambient temperature, carbon dioxide concentration, presence of breeze, etc. As water escapes the body, the tissues shrink, skin becomes dry and wrinkled, and eyes become sunken. As dehydration progresses, the plasma volume decreases, causing a fall in blood pressure. The organs are no longer perfused adequately and if this continues without corrective measures, the person progresses into hypovolemic shock. Organs including the heart and kidneys start failing. The heart fails to pump blood properly to the organs, the kidneys can no longer keep up their excretory function, toxins start building up, organ function worsens further and this causes a vicious cycle of events that ultimately leads to death. In the previous examples of people being pulled alive after a long time, almost all of them were lucky to have access to some form of water. Some drank their own urine and others consumed sewage water to survive. This is why I said earlier, how long one survives in such scenarios depends on the availability of water. So once air and water supply is ensured, the victims have a higher chance of survival. All they have to do is to wait until the rescuers find them. Imagine such a person buried under the rubble but with a concrete beam crushing his leg. Rescuers find and extricate him after 48 hours. Relieved, he is smiling and on his way to the hospital when suddenly he collapses and dies. What happened? This particular scenario, aptly nicknamed as the smiling death, is a condition known as crush syndrome. When muscles are subject to crush injury for prolonged periods of time, they undergo degradation known as traumatic rhabdomyolysis. Basically, the muscle breaks down, leaking its contents like myoglobin, potassium, phosphorus, etc. into the surrounding tissue. During extrication, once the muscles are relieved of this crushing pressure and circulation resumes, these leaked substances end up in various organs. If the potassium released from damaged muscles is high enough, it can upset the heart's rhythm, causing cardiac arrhythmias and sudden death. The leaked contents like myoglobin can damage the kidneys causing renal failure, which can also prove to be fatal. From what we have discussed so far, 
coming alive out of a quake hit building is nothing short of a miracle. So if we do find ourselves in such a situation, what are the things that we can do to increase our odds of survival? Before we do that, you can increase the odds of this video reaching interested audience such as yourself by liking and sharing it with your friends. If you find my content interesting, do consider subscribing to my channel for more updates. The basic rule in quake safety is if you are inside, stay inside and if you are outside, stay outside. The biggest myth surrounding earthquakes is that all the buildings collapse. This is the reason why the fight flight instinct urges people to run. Safety comes from taking quick action and finding a safe place within the first few seconds of the quake. The apt response if you are indoors is to drop, hold and cover. Drop to the floor, preferably underneath a table or floor in a safe section of the room you are in. Hold on until the shaking stops. Cover your face and head with your arms and make sure that your head is not the tallest thing in the room. Whatever movements that you do undertake should only be to get to the safest place using the fewest steps. If you are outside, get away from the danger zone the area immediately outside a building. This is where the likelihood of injury is the highest by means of falling bricks, windows or architectural details. How far away is safe? If you have to look way over your head to find the top of the building, you are probably safer inside it, as you won't have enough time or mobility to move away from such a tall building when the ground beneath is shaking. If you don't have to look up very much to see the top of the building, you probably are at a safe distance. The NDMA, National Disaster Management Authority of India, has issued guidelines to follow in case of an earthquake. I have shared the link in the description, do have a look. Remember, don't run, identify the nearest safe place, drop, hold and cover, protect your head. The only way to ensure quake safe action is to practice. Practice earthquake drills, prepare yourself mentally to identify those safe places in your surroundings, ensure clarity of mind and most importantly, don't panic. Even if you are not able to practice physically, at least try to visualize what you would do should the need arise. Remember, what you hear you forget, what you see you remember and what you do you understand. With that being said, this is the Bloody Physiologist signing off. Have a great day.